Um, again, a very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled AI Solutions in Manufacturing. My name is Saurabh Kumar and I'm on the marketing team here at HGO.AI. I'd love to start off by introducing our speakers. Uh, Eric Chu. Eric is armed with the technical know-how of data science, machine learning and big data analytics. He's equipped with the skill sets to value add businesses exploring into areas of AI uh, with an AI consultation approach. Our second speaker for the day, Zhang Hang. Uh, he works as a solution engineer, data scientist at H2.AI, and he's based in Singapore. Uh, he helps uh, with business, government, academia, and nonprofit organizations uh, in their transformation into AI. Now, before I hand it over to our speakers, I'd like to go over the following housekeeping items. Number one, please feel free to send us your questions throughout the session via the questions tab in your console. We'll be very happy to answer them towards the end of the session. This presentation is being recorded. A copy of the recording and a slide deck will be available uh, shortly after the presentation is over. Uh, without further ado, I'd not like to hand it over to Eric. Thank you, SK. All right, um, so for me, I will start my presentation now. So uh, just a quick introduction to who we are. So we are H2O. Uh, we are on a mission to democratize AI for everyone, making your company an AI company. All right, um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Industrial 4.0. I guess uh, pretty much when we talk about AI uh, in manufacturing, um, everyone links it to Industrial 4.0. Uh, on a Singapore strategy, well, this is what SG Innovate mentioned. Uh, it describes a trend where automation powered by data may be able to perform everyday tasks. So what I want to point to is, for sure, you could see that artificial intelligence and also IOTs are actually part of the strategy. But of course, one of the biggest concern of uh, Industry 4.0 is its impact on its workforce. So according to a McKinsey Global Institute of Research, between 400 million to 800 million jobs will be lost to automation by 2030. And that's a scary number to look at. But the same research paper also mentioned that only 5% of the current occupations will be automated by many of the existing job roles, and but many of the existing job roles will be redefined. So, of course, government's response is in various ways, such as to expand the science and technology programs. Um, of course, then the majority of um, the respondents on Energy Innovate survey are confident that Singapore will continue to remain a competitive R&D uh, and product development global hub in the next five to ten years. Let's look. A look back a little bit on the history of uh, um, Industrial 4.0. So Industrial 1.0, it begins in 1784. That's like three, 200 years ago. And uh, it begins with mechanization. Then subsequently, a year, a, a close to a century later, in 1870, the electrification uh, um, phase began. That's uh, Industrial 2.0. And then in the Industrial 3.0, uh, it begins in around 1970, where automation starts. That is where all the electronics and IT starts to um, be introduced into manufacturing. That's where the automated production process begins. So today, we are at our 4.0. So what do we call it? Connection, integration, or revolution? Of course, there are different um, terms that a lot of people is they're, 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 they're talking about it in, uh, in, in on, on forums, on uh, news and everywhere. And uh, what we are mainly looking at today is automation and data exchange and also digitalization. I, can, I think the, the main important thing in the Industrial 4.0 is really integrating and also fusioning um, these different technologies and techniques together. So of course, we are not going to drill into the history of uh, Industrial 4.0. Um, so, so if we look at it, um, the fourth the fourth evolution is really uh, uh, evolving at, at an exponential rather than a linear pace, and it's uh, it is disrupting almost every industry in every country. So some even say that it's already predicting our cultural interests. So today, uh, no longer as um, we are looking at um, um, manufacturing for demands, but rather a lot of time manufacturing is driven by uh, technological innovations. So there are four main effects of the fourth uh, um, industry revolution on its business. 
um, it is uh, heavily impacting on customers' expectation. Customers mm -hmm. will be expecting more because of uh, the technology uh, innovation. Um, there are more effects on the product enhancement. Today, you look at products, it's um, 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 evolving quite a bit. It's unlike the conventional products that we used to look at. And um, there's a lot of collaborative um, um, innovation. Um, a lot of uh, innovators tend to get um, their products innovated in a much uh, faster way. And of course, uh, we look at uh, how the different organizations are formed. So the conventional manufacturing firms um, have difficulties actually surviving in today's market. So um, closer to Industrial 4.0, so how is uh, AI uh, improving manufacturing? So there's quite a bit of use cases that we see um, in the market today. So uh, I'm just going to read the list uh, where it's not just these four um, use cases that we're looking at. But um, in actual fact, 29% of AI implementations in manufacturing are for maintaining machinery and production access. That's, uh, that's from a Capgemini uh, research team. And what General Motors are doing are actually they're implementing generative um, design algorithms that rely on machine learning techniques to factor in design constraints and improve optimized product design. And on, the, on Nissan, Nissan is piloting the use of AI to design new models in real time. Um, thus re reducing time to market for the next generation models. Of course, Audi uh, is analyzing images in real time to complete um, uh, products, product quality inspections in the automotive uh, industry. And the same technique is also used to help a lot of other manufacturers to stay in compliance and uh, with the stringent uh, regula regulatory um, requirements. So what Nokia is doing, they have introduced a video application that uses machine learning to alert an assembly operator um, if there are any inconsistency in the production process. Denon Group, a French multinational food products uh, manufacturer, uh, they are improving demand forecast accuracy with uh, machine learning. And the same technique is also used uh, in other industries to show uh, solid results uh, in, in, in demand forecasting. And with Tails, a leading supplier of electronic systems uh, uh, to a wide spread of um, in industries is actually using machine learning to predict pre preventing maintenance for high speed rail uh, lines throughout Europe. China Electric, um, they've created a predictive IoT analytics solution based on machine learning uh, to improve worker safety, reduce costs, and also achieve sustainable goals. And Canon, Canon has invented and advanced uh, asset defect recognition systems that brings new levels of um, uh, quality control to its manufacturing centers. So I guess um, when we look at AI in a nutshell, uh, main two main things. Uh, AI is there to actually help a lot of industry uh, optimize costs and also uh, looking uh, drastically on uh, reducing costs uh, in terms of uh, maintaining asset machineries and uh, materials. And uh, we are also looking at uh, um, improving yield. Uh, of course, if we could maximize every U in uh, uh, U performance in um, manufacturing processes, uh, that is what a lot of companies is doing. So of course, then we look at the AI plus data plus people is equal, is equal to a transformation. So a lot of uh, companies, they are actually on a uh, AI transformation today, especially on uh, manufacturing. So I'm going to touch a, touch a bit on um, use cases. Um, this is a typical use case in uh, um, crude palm oil refinery process. So as you can see, in, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, different um, processes involved in uh, crude, oil, uh, crude uh, palm oil refinery. So of course, um, over here in this process, what are the known, uh, known, known criteria? Meaning uh, the longer the heating time, uh, it will impact uh, the FAA, FFA remover. So the lower the left FFA, the better the quality of the CPO. So of course the unknowns are uh, before before unloading um, the, C, the 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 crude uh, CPO into the storage tank, they will go through a few process in the oven and weighing uh, to make sure that there's a 0.5% moisture. So what if we increase um, such um, values will there will there be significant significant uh, processes? I mean, significant improvement in the 
quality of C, uh, CPO, or if we if we hold um, the CPO within the oven for too long, it's actually a waste of resources. How much does it impact the, the quality of um, the CPO? So of course, then we are looking at um, using like utilizing the different parameters within the PLC, SCADA and uh, RTD to actually uh, monitor monitor the, uh, the the removal of the moisturize, moisture uh, before it gets um, um, into the, the production itself. So the, all these are actually parameters that we're collecting. And um, for every CPO refinery process, right, there will be a um, best practice, a guideline where the best data will actually, uh, how the best data will be actually look like. And with machine learning, uh, we can ensure that all different um, values and parameters are set to the optimal to ensure that a consistency in uh, the quality of the CPO. So next, uh, we look at the biodiesel um, um, manufacturing. So uh, when you look at a biodiesel uh, uh, process, right? Uh, of course, the byproduct it's uh, actually grisen, uh, which is also is a is one of uh, the content within detergent itself. So there are also different um, processes, complex complex processes within transesterification, uh, the catalyst, uh, washing and drying. Uh, of course, the known parameters are actually chemical refining uh, based on client's requirements. It doesn't does not really equals to yield itself. But of course, we will also like to find out when we are collecting all these different data within the trans uh, um, um, um process and chemical refining process, right? How can we actually uh, uh, um, optimize the amount of catalyst to be uh, included into the trans uh, process uh, after washing and drying? Uh, we get quality biodiesel at a um, cost-effective uh, process. So next, uh, we look at um, a robotic welding um, um, process. So supposed to be running. Um, so we, when we look at this, is this is typical welding process where um, um, we collect some of this welding data. So as we know, welding. Uh, when we when we look at the welding process, uh, it, re it typically requires high current at a lo relatively low voltage. So um, from the welding power amplifier itself, we are already collecting data points like voltage, current, wire, wire speed, arc time, or even wire de deposition. And when we are looking at a robotic arms, um, it's the motions of the robotic arms are very much controlled. Therefore, um, the, all this can be actually controlled. So for how how this this um use case work is that um while it's doing its uh, welding work, um the system can the, the machine machine learning itself can actually predict uh how the quality of every well, so that when we look at it um we do not need to wait to the QC uh, portion before we determine if a uh, welding is uh, of good quality and no rework no rework is required. And when we talk about welding, right, um, the material plays a big part as well. So understanding the material and of course the deterioration of the welding kit uh, also plays a very big part. So when we look into a uh, welding process uh, in automotive, uh, every car chassis has close to a thousand welding points and only a handful of the welding points can be actually um, QC. So, so it's actually tough to actually for, for automotive uh, manufacturers to actually make sure that every well is uh, of good quality. That is where machine learning actually comes in to actually help uh, in some of this uh, area. Um, so a little bit introduction on H2O AI and ML platform. Um, so when we look at these different processes, um, a big part of it, a big chunk of it is actually uh, machine learning and training the right model to actually uh, use this model to do uh, predictions for the processes. So when we look at machine learning, right, um, we are looking at data, uh, loading the data, running into uh, running an uh, automatic machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, this is where driverless AI can actually handle, uh, which is our core product, can actually handle a majority big portion of it. Task uh, with the model that's being trained, 
it is being converted into a module which can be actually implemented into um, DH devices. Uh, when we look at this, very much we are looking at uh, IoT devices, a system that is managing the IoT that are uh, um, parameters and stuff. So we, we, we do have another product uh, called Q. Q is able to um, build AI apps and actually um, um, implement some all, all these algorithms into uh, DH devices. And all this uh, manage, management of uh, models deployment and stuff is actually managed by what we call uh, model ops, where it can actually um, 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 uh, produce a, actually a learning feedback loop to actually retrain some of these models when a certain accuracy falls below uh, a certain value. So of course, when we look at uh, um, what the products can actually uh, help with a lot of organizations, um, as uh, many un understands that uh, H2O has, um, um, has around 10% of um, the Kager grandmasters uh, of the world. And uh, all these expertise are actually inbuilt into our platform. And uh, beyond using the platform itself, we have got the domain expertise and also our data science expertise uh, that's uh, helping our customers. Um, of course, what used to be, uh, what used to take weeks and months to build uh, for machine learning models now can be actually reduced into uh, days or even hours. But, uh, and of course, uh, whatever our customers build on our platform, like um, that's transparency. All these models are being uh, 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 all explainable. There are features within our platform to actually help our customers to justify the models that's being built. And on top of that, uh, we have got our customer success team. Um, and their goal is to uh, focus and ensure our customer success. Um, the results in overall happiness leading to expansion of the product's usage. Of course, there's a few key points that our customer, our, 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 our customer success team looks at. Um, the resolution of technical errors, the installation supports and user uh, assignment, um, of course, and a regu regular cadence call with our uh, customers. So, um, of course, um, we also have our open source products. So, uh, as I guess many makers know that um, H2O's uh, main uh, open source product is H2O3, uh, which, is a, which could be a standalone platform. Um, and we also have our sparkling water, which is a deployment architecture on Spark itself. So of course then, um, all our open source products are actually free to use for everyone. And when customers who are on our open source platforms are looking for enterprise support, we do have our enterprise support. And uh, of course, everyone has heard of uh, enterprise team. Enterprise team is uh, available tr through our enterprise support. So overall, we look, we look to partner with our um, customers on an AI journey, bring together all the experts, not just uh, our data experts, the Kega Grandmasters, but also uh, our domain experts. Uh, we reference learning from our different customers and communities of hundreds of uh, successful use cases and actually share this experience where we actually impart this knowledge to our new customers. And using our world-class technology platforms like Driverless AI, uh, we discuss how we can actually uh, work together on a journey uh, to, to help our customer, customers to achieve their future goals. And that's all I have. Okay. All right, thank you, Eric. So I'm going to take over from here so in the uh, next segments I'm going to talk about um, so uh, uh, everyone can see a, a, a yellow background okay all right okay in this segment I'm going to talk about uh, a specialized branch of uh, manufacturing is called bio uh, pharmaceuticals uh, manufacturings uh, so before we start uh, let me uh, briefly introduce let me uh, just briefly introduce uh, uh, myself. I joined uh, H2O in February two, uh, 2020. And before that, I was uh, I, I worked for Bank of America. Merrill Lynch is Hong Kong. And before that, I worked for Teradata, where I carry out a data science project uh, in a, a few countries. And these are some of the projects that, uh, that are somewhat related to uh, what I'm talking about in the uh, United States and Europe. OK, this is uh, the outline of uh, 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 my discussions. I'm going to start with the, uh, the uh, 
briefly different between conventional and biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Then we go in um, slightly more in depth, but not too deep into how AI can be used to overcome some of the uh, very very pressing uh, problems and challenges in the biopharmaceutical uh, manufacturing. Uh, after that, we we'll talk a little bit about markets and economics and uh, uh, conclusions. So when you go to uh, see doctor and your know, doctor prescribe medicines to you like uh, Panadol or uh, or aspirins or ibuprofen and so on and so forth. Those are conventional pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals, so they are chemical-based uh, uh, drugs. And there is another type of uh, medicine called biologic drugs, which is uh, derived from uh, biological sources. So what what, what are the uh, uh, biological uh, uh, sources? Uh, these are the examples, some of the examples, recombinant proteins, allergens, or better known as the uh, vaccines, uh, blood, uh, blood products, cells, tissue, and uh, in, in the recent times, so there have been a new type of biology being developed in order to fight COVID-19. Uh, um, so um, in the midst of the pandemic, I think uh, bio biopharmaceutical manufacturing is a very timely topic to talk about. Um, so, and uh, these are the example of uh, uh, commonly used uh, biologics. Uh, insulin is a very, very well known, has a long history to treat uh, diabetes and antibody to uh, uh, Treat uh, cancer and a stem cell to uh, repair damaged tissues. And uh, so the hottest topic now is the uh, production of vaccines, yeah, to induce uh, uh, immune system against uh, uh, viruses. And uh, these are the example of uh, a different type of disease. Uh, facilities in the manipulation. Uh, so let's say you want to build, uh, produce the antibody to uh, treat cancer. So first you need to identify uh, the target. So usually it's a, a surface protein on a cancer cell that you want the antibody to bind to and kill the cancer cell. Uh, so once you have identified the right target, you need to uh, uh, find out which genes uh, produce this target and then you take it out and you put inside a special vehicle called vectors. So this is a vehicle, it helps you to uh, make a multiple copies of the uh, antigen, which is your, your target. Uh, so you put this uh, vehicle inside the live cell uh, so that the, when the cell, when the cell divide and uh, propagate, it will also uh, propagate the, uh, this vehicle. Yeah. Uh, so how do you propagate? You put inside a, a nutrients, a medium uh, that the cells, the cell can consume. Now, when you put these things inside the cell, not all cells, some of the cells will get it, but those cells will, uh, uh, which uh, uh, get the vectors, not all will be uh, productive. Uh, so this is a very crucial step, uh, usually about the neck, where you need to find a few among the millions that uh, that are able to produce this antigen in large quantity. Uh, so so you, you propagate the cell and they are divided into multiple plus. Uh, very much like uh, how how Hadoop works, so parallel processing. Uh, so this is like the live cell version of a of a Hadoop. Yeah. Okay. So after that, uh, uh, the, the cells will go out and uh, produce a lot of the antigen. You, you you extract this antigen out and inject into the um, the mice. Uh, so when you inject to the mice, the mice will develop the antibody uh, to fight this antigen to kill this antigen. And uh, so all the antibody producing cells are inside a, an uh, organ called spleen. Uh, so you perform surgery on the uh, uh, the mouse, take out the spleen. And extract the cell, and then this cell has the uh, uh, gene that produces uh, antibody against that antigen. So uh, we use a technique called PCR to extract. Uh, there are two genes actually. What is called this is antibody. Uh, so the, the inner uh, structure that looks like the letter Y that is what we call the heavy chain, and the outside one is called light chain. So uh, different genes uh, uh, are responsible for the different heavy chain and light chain. Uh, so you take these two genes out and you humanize it. What does it mean by humanize it? You need to change, because this is a mouse, from mouse, you can't use it directly on human. So you need to modify the DNA sequence by introducing mutation so that so that the re resulted uh, molecule, antibody molecule, you uh, mimic closer to human than mouse. Yeah. So again, you take this two gene and uh, put it inside another vehicle and you propagate it and then you grow the cells uh, in the uh, small bioreactor and then to, uh, uh, after the uh, cell reach a uh, certain populations, 
or density. So we transfer to a bigger uh, bioreactor and then to a bigger bioreactor. So at the same time, uh, uh, while transferring to a bigger bioreactor, you might want to take some of these out and uh, uh, some of this dead body out and inject into the animals uh, to see if a uh, if uh, uh, animal develop uh, uh, any uh, adverse response against the uh, drug. Uh, in other words, if the drug in any body cause like uh, uh, become toxic to the animal. And, and uh, so and uh, and go on and uh, I produce in the larger uh, bioreactor. Uh, after that, uh, extract the antibody out, uh, bottle and patients. Yeah. So this is the uh, the overall end to end process. So in in what way that we can apply artificial intelligence on this bio process? Uh, sorry, bio manufacturing uh, process. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is uh, uh, predictive maintenance. So using machine learning to predict failures. Yeah. Uh, so this is a schematic of uh, uh, a typical unit operations of bioreactors. Uh, so inside this uh, tank, so they are live cells that produce, keep on producing this antibody. Uh, so the blue, the liquid thing, this is a medium, the nutrients that the, uh, the food that the uh, cells need. And so over time, uh, the cells will grow into a, a, a large number and will consume a lot of uh, these nutrients. So you need to replenish the nutrients. And you, uh, so uh, this nutrient need to be fed into this at a certain rate cannot be too fast or cannot be too slow. Uh, so you have a, a, a lot of uh, IoT uh, sensor uh, placed all over the, uh, the the system in order to uh, track uh, those parameters, pH temperature, biomass, uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Right. Uh, so um, now, so this all this every all the components that work properly at all times uh, in order to uh, uh, get to the product. Yeah. Uh, so therefore it. So we, we, we have to do uh, something in order to make sure that it will run properly at all time. Uh, so uh, we, we must do a lot of things in order to prevent any of the components, bioreactor or any of the peripheral uh, equipment uh, to break down. So now we go into the uh, uh, maintenance. So, so historically, there are several maintenance, reactive maintenance. So ma reactive maintenance means you go and re repair the things, fix the thing only uh, uh, when it breaks down. So it, it can be very expensive, costly uh, in terms of uh, finance and in terms of uh, lives. Okay. So uh, parts are con connected to each other and one part sell, it might uh, affect the other. Yeah. So preventive maintenance is a scheduled maintenance, which is a, 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 a recommendation from the vendors and so on. Uh, uh, so it costs less expensive, but it has a drawback, which is uh, if you do it, maintenance change part too early. So you waste the machine's still usable lives. Uh, so in the uh, in the era of our AI, uh, so we can do predictive maintenance. Uh, so how does uh, predictive maintenance work? So we go to the next slide. Uh, so the concept behind predictive maintenance is that over time, uh, equipment, uh, bioreactor, or any peripheral devices, the performance of this uh, uh, infrastructure will degrade over time. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is time when you uh, work together with the uh, uh, domain experts uh, to define uh, uh, where do we think that we should draw a line. And uh, to treat which part is the uh, uh, here is the target one means a uh, need attentions on need uh, fixing on this uh, uh, maintenance and so there are two uh, 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 strategy uh, to to uh, to define or uh, to draw the line uh, one is the uh, uh, strategy for the binary calculation so does the uh, does the uh, machine needs maintenance yes a one or no a zero or you can uh, do a um, uh, multi class uh, classifications of of the uh, the uh, uh, the status of the machine yeah um so uh, one of the things that uh, you can do is to define a cycle what does it means by cycle so a cycle finding a good cycle uh, can help you to build a, a good uh, data for machine learning training so that you can build a robust and accurate model for uh, this is uh, one uh, suggestion that um, before you, you, you produce antibody, you soon you need to clean the bioreactor and then you need to sterilize the bioreactor at high heat and then fill up with the medium, the nutrients, and then uh, put the cell in, uh, get the product out. And then, so this is a one cycle. So uh, because of this mechanical processes, so up each cycle, it will degrade the, uh, the, uh, the performance of the system like, uh, uh, further. Uh, uh, so um, in order to uh, uh, predict to be if uh, uh, a particular machine or system is going to uh, break down soon. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the things that we can uh, do is to produce a calculation of on 
the machines in terms of uh, 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 determining is a remaining useful life. So this is uh, uh, a simplified version on how you can uh, calculate the remaining useful life. Uh, uh, so recap the cycle that is uh, uh, going around uh, after the uh, cleaning, sterilization, batch process. So after each cycle, and then you collect the data from IoT, and then you go to the next cycle. Let's say at the cycle 100 and 103, so the machine breaks down. Uh, so you have a historical record on uh, every cycle. Uh, uh, before the uh, final breakdown. So uh, this this uh, uh, collected data is uh, where you can uh, de derive the uh, the degradation of the uh, equipment performance. Yeah, and so you collect the all sensor data, data uh, uh, put it in the uh, uh, structure it properly, uh, clean it, and then uh, what you can do is you backtrack you backtrack the uh, the, uh, the the fail cycle a, a few a few times a few cycle backtrack, and uh, let's say at hundred. And then you, you do a calculation like so the for cycle one the remaining useful life would be minus minus one hundred minus one is ninety nine and then you do this calculation ninety eight ninety eight ninety seven and so and so on and so forth yeah so after that and then you can label the data as a urgent short uh, short or, or long or uh, one and zero one and zero yeah okay so this this will be uh, becoming the uh, your remaining useful life. And you can snap it into uh, your, your uh, structured or clean uh, uh, sensor data and become a, a data that you can use to train your machine learning model to predict. Yeah. To predict the, uh, uh, if, if a particular machine or bioreactor is going to fail. Yeah. Uh, so this is the actual uh, uh, predictive maintenance data that I have run in the, uh, uh, driver's AI. Um, so this is a, a performance on metrics. So this, uh, this, this slide is just to show you that uh, uh, these are some of the results that you, you can get from the driver's AI on a predictive maintenance. In this case, I, I did, uh, this is actually from aircraft engine, not from bioreactor, but uh, so they work the same. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, people use driver's AI for is to, uh, you can perform many experiments. So the uh, uh, automated feature engineering can help you to reduce some of the cri critical uh, metric for example, in the uh, bioreactor or, or aircraft engine, so it's a very very crucial to reduce the false negative. Yeah, it is okay to false uh, to have a higher false positive, but a false negative is a very dangerous. For aircraft, means that the uh, the engine needs a urgent urgent maintenance, but you say that it still have a long life, so it could it could spell a disaster, uh, aircraft crash. In bioreactor terms, so uh, you might you might have uh, uh, you might not be able to get your uh, product. Yeah, uh, so if the equipment thing, yeah. And uh, so um, another output that you can get from uh, a driver's AI is variable important. It tells you that based on the predictions, uh, uh, whether or not this bioreactor or this equipment breakdown. So what what, are, what is the most uh, important uh, variable? The second most important variable, third, and so on, and so on and so forth. So from here you can actually uh, make use of the variable importance to make a certain decision. For example, if the prediction says this particular bioreactor is going to break down. Then you can uh, you can have the option to look look back or check the variable importance. Uh, for example, this sensor eleven is corresponding to the uh, uh, let's say CO two analyzer, and uh, this is corresponding to the uh, the air airflow, uh, for example. So, and uh, this prediction tell you the, uh, the the reason the reason for 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 failure. So you can uh, actually attend. Uh, specifically to that particular component. Uh, for example, uh, uh, check the uh, uh, CO2 tank whether it is it still has the uh, uh, enough pressure, yeah, uh, so that it uh, it can uh, provide so the necessary uh, uh, gas or air and oxygen and nitrogen to to the cell to grow properly. Yeah, and uh, so that was the bioreactor. So this bioreactor must must be placed inside a very very specialized uh, facility. Uh, in the biomanufacturing, we call it the GMP facility, good manufacturing practice facility. So it is a very confined, very, very clean environment and uh, the regulatory and compliance dictate that. So for, for such uh, therapeutic uh, uh, protein production, uh, so the facility must, must not uh, exceed like uh, 100 particulates per, per meter cube. Yeah. So depending on the country and also the uh, the, the context, it can be uh, like uh, some dictates that it, it cannot be a uh, uh, more than a thousand 
So what it cannot be more than 100 is one of the most stringent. Yeah. And uh, so because of this regulatory, uh, so biobenchmarking facility uh, has uh, like uh, sensors and uh, edge devices like uh, placed all over the facilities to detect, uh, for example, the filter, uh, uh, the ventilations, the lighting, and also who can access to this facility and so on. Yeah. So uh, um, so all the, all this data can be used uh, to uh, to do uh, predictive maintenance and how, uh, for example. So you can uh, collect the data from the uh, uh, ambient parameter pressure, temperature, lightings, and put it as a feature. And uh, who the human traffic uh, who came in and who went out for how long? So can also be used as uh, to, uh, to uh, as a feature. So ventilations and a filter. And so this is a, a, a the target. Uh, so the purpose of and then you can uh, use, for example, diverse AI to create a predict. A predictive model in order to predict like contamination risk. So am I at uh, is this uh, facility at risk of uh, being contaminated? Yeah. So that is the uh, uh, the second part of uh, uh, make predictive maintenance. Okay. Mm. Um, so for this facility, uh, predictive maintenance uh, for the facility in order to predict a contamination. Let's say in your historical record, so you have contamination at this time, another contamination at this time. And uh, at this time, so what you can do is uh, how you can uh, what can you uh, what you can uh, uh, do is you uh, you sample let's say um, uh, uh, time to like just before the contaminations and uh, uh, the IoT data just before the uh, this contamination and this contaminations and build a table and uh, uh, you can do the uh, labeling so this part is uh, contaminated contaminated so these are the uh, the data on uh, what happened just before the uh, contamination yeah. And then, so and then you can uh, actually use this as a training data and feed into the uh, driver's AI to build a machine learning model. And uh, so you can, uh, uh, driver's AI give you the ability uh, to deploy, I mean, to take that machine learning model out of the driver's AI out and place it elsewhere on, on the on the edge devices, on your sensor, on your personal computer and so on. Uh, so you, and then the uh, IoT data that you collected uh, can be, can be uh, uh, fed into the uh, uh, this model, this portable model module, and uh, do the predictions. And uh, what else can you do? Uh, drivers AI also give you the interpretability uh, uh, model for model as well as the results. So all these uh, automatically, all these uh, drivers generate automatically generate reports for the interpretability that you can uh, use to communicate with the regulatory body, uh, bodies so that they can uh, like uh, devise new regulation and policy for uh, a better facility design. Yeah. So another thing that we can use AI for is the uh, toxicity prediction. So every biology medicine must be made safe for a patient. So uh, therefore, they they must undergo toxicity test. Uh, so the, uh, the the drug uh, 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 must be injected into animal to see if an animal has any adverse uh, reactions to it. So how do we uh, do that? Um, so again, there are uh, IoT data available. Uh, uh, for example, uh, pH temperature medium, and uh, now we have an uh, unprecedented ability to actually characterize and study uh, cells at the genome level. So that is a very, very so those data that we, we get from uh, 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 genome experiments are very 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 valuable. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you can use co combine this data with the uh, uh, other physical data, and then um, again, so these are the things that you can uh, predict did the antibody uh, bind. So uh, that means is the antibody working or did the animal uh, develop uh, toxicity? Yeah. Uh, so you can build a, a training data again. And uh, from the training data, you build a machine learning model. Uh, and then in your next project, so you have a new data coming in. Now you can, uh, uh, you're able to predict. So which particular batch, which clone uh, has the lowest probability. And then you set, select those clones and inject uh, into animals. Hopefully, uh, this clone really, really uh, uh, will not develop toxicity uh, in, within the animals. Uh, so uh, uh, still develop toxicity, if yes, and then go back to the model, uh, the, uh, uh, get more features, okay, improve the, the algorithm. Uh, so if uh, no, then go to the production. So if you repeat this many, many times, eventually, hopefully that, um, so we'll be able to 
uh, uh, minimize our dependence on the animal model. Yeah. So this has a, a few overriding benefits. So what are those? Reduce development costs and uh, a uh, uh, shortage of of uh, uh, talent. And of course, it would reduce the time to market and uh, and uh, reduce the corporate uh, reputation risk and also the uh, the safety and well-being of the scientists themselves. Yeah. So again, uh, so you can also uh, because you can also use the auto auto generated reports to communicate to regular property uh, uh, bodies in order to uh, yeah uh, de develop a, a better uh, toxicity uh, strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and then um, so one of the uh, most crucial step is to uh, be able to extract the uh, uh, productive cells. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So now, uh, okay. Uh, just recap on uh, the earlier part of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, uh, presentation that we saw. Um, so the genes that has been inserted into the vehicle, it must be inserted into the cell. Uh, so and uh, uh, let me repeat that. Uh, not all cells will get the vehicle first, and those cells who get the vehicle, not all becomes a uh, productive. Uh, uh, so. This is uh, one strategy that we can use in order to uh, uh, create a training set that we can uh, uh, develop or build a machine learning model to predict if a particular cell is a, uh, is a productive cell. Uh, for example, so uh, you randomly like, pick uh, cells and, and grow it, uh, propagate the cells, after that you extract the DNA. So again, you, you, you snap the, uh, the physical data with the genomic data together and then uh, uh, label it uh, whether or not uh, a particular cone is uh, uh, productive or not productive, yeah. Uh, so you feed into the drivers, build a model, yeah, and build, build a model. You can use a model in the next in your next project to uh, to better determine um, to better determine if a particular uh, uh, clone or batch of cells is going to be productive instead of running many many uh, lab experiments to determine that, yeah. Um, so this is how I envision if uh, uh, how machine learning can change this practice in the future. For example, we look at this. The current practice is that you put a vehicle in the cell, and then you try to find the one or the few uh, among the millions that that are useful. So uh, how will uh, uh, AI uh, change uh, this practice? So uh, I envision that uh, by using by combining the uh, genomic or DNA data with the uh, physical da data. Uh, we use machine learning to pick the few that few that are going to be uh, uh, productive, and then we only we only uh, insert the vehicle on that few that have been selected by machine learning. Yeah, instead of performing many many trials and errors in the laboratory, uh, so it reduces it reduces the iterations or the the number of trials and errors that you need to perform the laboratory work. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I will go it uh, talk a little bit about the um, the markets and and the economies of uh, the antibody. Um, so this is a list of a current treatment strategy used by hospital uh, doctors, oncologists um, to treat can, uh, cancer from surgery to radius radius therapy, hormone therapy, and uh, chemotherapy and uh, uh, immunotherapy, which is a uh, uh, the use of antibody to treat uh, uh, treatments. Uh, it is it worth about 97 billion dollars. Uh, this is uh, for, for, for cancer. Yeah. So among the, the 97 billions, actually antibody takes up about 41 billion dollars. So it, it is a big business, it's a big business. However, the it, for each antibody to be produced, it costs the pharmaceutical companies years and uh, probably have a billions of the dollars of the investment. Uh, so therefore, as an investor, you as an investor, uh, uh, how, how we go about the investing in a particular uh, uh, drug or in a particular target. Uh, ta uh, target. Yeah. Uh, so there are criteria used by investors and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so in the era of AI, this is something that you can do. Okay. Um, try to predict which candidate uh, uh, will most likely be approved by FDA. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to show you uh, one example of uh, uh, achieving this using an NFP-based classification. Uh, uh, so this is done in the driver's AI as well. And uh, so this is the PubMed. PubMed is a search engine for 
the uh, a scientific journal and abstract. Yeah. So this is an example of a scientific uh, abstract you can you can uh, pull from the uh, from the uh, apartment. Yeah. Uh, so there's an API that you can uh, convert this uh, free text into a structured table uh, that has a title, abstract, a journal, who wrote the article, which year, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So once you have this structure, you can actually easily uh, uh, feed it into a driver's AI to create a, a machine learning model. Then you can use a model to uh, predict a new publications uh, to identify which publication has the uh, most pot uh, potential cancer target, uh, which will become the uh, antibody uh, to be approved by uh, FDA. Yeah. Uh, so this screenshot uh, uh, shows uh, some of the experiment settings that I use in order to make these predictions. And uh, um, yeah, driver's AI comes with the uh, NLP specific settings that we can uh, uh, do. So this is uh, look slightly different from the previous one. Yeah, and these are some of the metrics that I I I, I got in uh, in trying to predict the next uh, antibody to be approved by uh, FDA. And uh, uh, so this is uh, another metric that I use uh, our sample. Yeah, our sample data. And this is the result of uh, uh, my prediction. So this. Uh, so this is the outcome of the predictions. So what I got is, um, so I, I, I look through the uh, the one that uh, has a highest probability of becoming uh, FDA approved drugs. So I, I look through each each of these and uh, uh, read the uh, abstract. And uh, so this is my conclusions that uh, in my predictions, I think that a few of these targets will uh, be the next FDA approved uh, EGFR and uh, PD1, uh, PDL1, yeah. So and then uh, from from this you can uh, there are actually identification number that you can uh, track. So at the investor, uh, so so uh, uh, you might you might want to uh, like uh, examine this this publication further, see who wrote this article, and go to the uh, organization, the university, and so on, and talk to them and uh, uh, and uh, invest the money on them to further develop yeah that particular drug. Yeah. Okay. Um. So um. In this. Conclusions. Um, so let me just uh, sum up uh, uh, what I have talked about in, the, um, in uh, using AI for pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, so in the uh, in the midst of uh, our pandemic, so we need to get the drugs out very very quickly, and patient cannot afford to break down. So we can use AI to do predictive maintenance, and uh, our cells need to be productive, uh, no time to lose, and AI can help find uh, those few or the one among the billions. And the biology medicine must be safe, and so we can use AI to help predict the cytotoxic uh, uh, toxicity, and also hopefully to reduce the dependence on animal models. And uh, biology medicine is to reach patients fast and in large quantity, so AI has the potential to reduce the uh, time to market. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so a few uh, before we conclude, a uh, few points to ponder is that um. So uh, based on my experience and in both life science and the industries and also in the uh, in the field of AI, so I think life science could be the next frontier for AI. And in light of the uh, pandemics, it is even more so now. Yeah, uh, AI could be the next frontier for life science. So I say life science uh, uh, to do life science, uh, perform life science or biopharmaceuticals experiment uh, efficiently. So AI can definitely help. So in the face of uh, pandemic, so uh, AI we can use AI to help with in one thing, which is to do things right the first time. Yeah. And uh, so because of this, I, I envision that uh, automated machine learning is, bucket, is uh, becoming increasingly uh, indispensable. Yeah. And that concludes the uh, presentations of uh, how you can use uh, AI for the biomanufacturing, biopharmaceutical manufacturing. And uh, I thank you for your attention. And uh, back to Thank you so much, Eric uh, and John, for doing such a great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat window. Let's try to get most of them with the time we have at hand. Uh, the first question yeah. we have asks us, um, have any industry deployments utilized deep info reinforcement learning? Um, okay. I don't have the uh, statistics of how many uh, 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 using deep reinforcement learning, but uh, from my uh, previous experiments, uh, sorry, uh, previous experience with the Bank of America and my communication with the, uh, the those hedge funds uh, people, uh, deep in reinforcement learning is uh, uh, being being uh, 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 u
uh, develop, uh, especially um, on the uh, uh, this is sorry. I think there was some audio issues there, um, but thank you for taking a stab at it, uh, John. Uh, we have another question that says, can you discuss how AI is used to automate and environmentally sustainable supply choices while keeping business costs competitive? Either of you could take that. Yeah, uh, can you repeat the question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, how can AI be used to automate environmentally sustainable supply choices while keeping business costs competitive? Oh, okay. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, so these are some of the things uh, that you can use AI for. Or, for example, um, um, network optimizations. So finding the uh, best route. Yeah. So finding the uh, shortest route, the uh, uh, most optimum route to uh, uh, like transport your good. So you actually practically reduce the consumptions of fuel. Yeah. So another one is a, a, a demand optimizations, um, a cat catastrophic modeling, and so I want to bring your attention to uh, hold on, which which is a. Uh, Hold on. which is a reduced waste waste so if you can find the uh, shortest route to transport your goods you reduce the um, uh, you reduce the uh, the consumption of fuel so you can also reduce waste out ah, here by by yeah by having the uh, uh, a better inventory management ah. so one of the things that you can do in uh, managing your inventory better is to do time series forecast yeah so you reduce the uh, uh, turnover and wastage. Yeah. Uh, so these are some of the things that you can do to make it uh, environmental sustainable. Yeah. So you don't stop too much. Uh, at the end, that you throw things away. Yeah. And and so on. So forth. Yeah. So if you look at it, um, so I guess uh, when okay. you look at it, there are multiple ways of um, <clears throat> sustaining uh, in terms of wastage, in terms of optimizing processes. Like what I mentioned, uh, with AI, you can actually uh, reduce cost and also uh, maximize the use. So that, I guess, uh, with AI, um, it's not just one use case or one particular model that you're looking at. You're looking at a combination of different uh, models being put together uh, that, that actually digitalize experience and knowledge and actually put into the whole process and actually uh, get a complete outcome from uh, the whole AI uh, journey. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, the next one says, what part of procurement analysis can be predicted and how can we analyze uh, near sourcing? I'm assuming this is for supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you want to take that? Yeah, um, I guess when we look at procurement process, a lot of time um, we are looking to buy at the lowest cost. Uh, and, uh, at times when you buy a different bulk of uh, um, uh, um, um, items inventory right um, you're looking at uh, um, to, to get the optimal uh, quantity so at certain quantity at certain price that is the lowest that you get but of course if if that kind of qu uh, quantity right that you are uh, you, you put it in your 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 shelf and uh, it gets it stays on the shelf for too long the demand is low so actually, um, how do you actually prevent that? You do not want to buy at a low price where you keep all these uh, stocks in your warehouse for a long time where it's not moving because it's low demand. So um, when we look at um, um, using AI, right, uh, you can actually get the base model uh, in terms of uh, demand. Uh, what are the demand for this particular uh, um, product? Uh, will it stay on my shelf for at least uh, for, for, for the next few weeks or once I get them in and they will start moving kind of thing. So um, you're looking at two particular different models to predict. That means, um, should I buy this particular product at this particular low price with this quantity? And uh, when I buy at this quantity, will it stay on my shelf for a long time because there's low demand? Or how can I actually augment the demand 
uh, so that I can actually predict the sales forecast for this particular product. So that's very much on, uh, I think, optimizing cost itself. Uh, of course, when you are maximize, how, how do you actually maximize the yield? Then uh, you're looking at um, 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 demand forecasting. So that means to actually forecast um, the sales of this particular product based on the demand in the market. So I guess um, when, we, when, we, when we look at for sales forecast alone, right, um, we can typically look at this is how much we sell uh, during this period of time last year. And this should be how much we'll be selling this year. But no one will know that uh, COVID-19 is coming. And no one will actually predict sales, uh, you know, at an optimal level. So there, there are, um, there are, there are different solutions like uh, with H2O, with Q, we have got um, um, demand uh, augmentation where we actually put in uh, public data, we take news data and stuff like that. You can LP, you put it into Q, and then we actually uh, do a more effective sales forecast. So these are ways to actually optimize your your your, your you. Um, okay, let me uh, uh, add uh, on top of what Eric has said. Uh, so this is one of the ways that you can use a uh, time series forecast to uh, optimize your demand. Uh, so this is a, 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 a TIPAS ridership data. So we have IoT data coming from uh, uh, GPS which locations and also uh, uh, from your your the uh, the, the, car, the bus card. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you can fit this into a driver's AI to train the uh, uh, time series model. Uh, where you can uh, uh, the output can be used for uh, planning and operations and uh, procurement as, as well. And for example, this is one case. Like for example, um, uh, by using uh, this is a, a actual uh, experiment in the uh, driver's AI. Uh, this is a bus ridership and uh, uh, this is location A. So it's a this is the the forecast. I the forecast for for next week. And uh, for uh, for the same uh, uh, week ahead, ahead. So I have a location two uh, with a uh, with a forecast uh, which is higher than the uh, location one. And uh, so, and uh, usually you 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 put like four buses location one. Uh, you have four bus four buses in location two. So with this uh, forecast, then you can uh, better manage your your uh, resource allocation. Right there. So you transfer two two of the buses from location one to location two. Yeah. So that is one way of uh, uh, optimizing your resources. So instead of buying new bus to serve the uh, second location, so you, you use a, a, a forecast uh, AI in terms of a time series forecast to to uh, uh to uh, relocate okay relocate uh, your resources so, yeah thank you so much eric and john um we're at the top of the hour um if you have any concluding thoughts uh for our audience now would be the time to you know conclude uh yeah yeah, the automated uh, machine learning you prove its worth, especially in the time of uh, pandemic where. Um, so I'll just uh, repeat myself that uh, at a time like this, uh, uh, we need all the help that we can to do things right the first time. Yeah, so AI is one and uh, uh, automated machine learning is uh, will further reinforce or uh, further empower us, empower data scientists. Yeah, so. Uh, I believe it will be a... uh, so I guess uh, uh, if we reference to um, industrial uh, 4.0 AI indispensable tools and now yeah, AI is change. actually part of uh, the, the blueprint at least for the Singapore strategy and I guess uh, pretty much uh, manufacturing firms today should be already on the AI wave so if you're not, uh, I guess everyone will really need to look into it because it's unlike um, conventional frameworks where what works for my competitors will work for me. Because um, in when we talk about AI, every unique, every data is unique. What works for you doesn't work for uh, others. But of course, we can look at it. Um, we can use the best practice, but it's still a lot of work being done. So when we are looking at uh, time to market, uh, I think today, uh, everyone's struggling because of the pandemic, um, shutdowns, you can't really do your research, research only starts going, but of course then you have to make full use of your time. And especially, I guess, when you look into the uh, health science, pharmaceutical, um, data science alone is complex, but then you look into the process of manufacturing um, medicine, it's even more complex. So um, in terms of complexity, if you're not using AI, it's going to be very tough, very tough to actually uh, derive at uh, um, certain uh, favorable outcomes. So I guess um, AI wave is here to stay. It's going to be here for at least the next five to 10 years. 
and yeah, I think uh, it's really high time that a lot of uh, manufacturing firms really look into AI seriously. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our audience for you know taking the time and you know uh, discussing the solutions in manufacturing. Uh, the presentation slides and the recording will be sent out shortly after. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.